Dr. Lewis Berry Chaper addressing students of Dallas Theological Seminary in lectures on the spiritual life. Lecture 1, Introduction to the Believer's Responsibility. Subtopics 1, Intelligent Motives, 2, Dependence on the Spirit, and 3, The Word of God. you beyond that you 
believe on Christ. You add nothing to it at all by anything that you can do. All down through the history of gospel preaching, we've had all kinds of things being added to the one simple thing of believing. The most prolific thing has been repent and believe. But that is not in the scripture. It's just not there at all. Repent and believe. I recognize that dear Dr. Ironside has just written a book on the text or the title, except she all likewise repent. And I'm just forced to say that I think he's he got off on the wrong foot with regard to it because he has not understood what the meaning of repentance is. It's a change of mind. And you cannot believe on Christ in the sense of taking your confidence off whatever's on that's on before and putting it upon Christ. You cannot do that without having a change of mind. And it's all one thing, not two actions. It's all included in one action. If I'm looking out this window, I may decide to look out that window. But I can't I can't look out that window without leaving this one. It's involved and I must leave it. If I've been depending upon something in myself, in my relation to God, as some people do, and then I decide to put all my dependence on Christ for my salvation, then I've had a change of mind, and that's repentance. And that's the only repentance that anybody ever is asked to produce. I shall have much to say about that when, at later times when we come upon it. Your responsibility comes to the front now. When I published a little book entitled, He That Is Spiritual, which has had a very unusual distribution and sale, has just been translated into Spanish and has gone into various languages. I think it's in French as well as in Spanish. He That Is Spiritual, the great theologian Warfield, and I'm ready to say that we had no greater living in the world at the time than Benjamin Warfield, who was located at Princeton at the time. They have no such one now as they had in the case in the instance of Warfield. Warfield took up the little book that I published. I don't know how he came to get hold of it and reviewed it in what was known as the Princeton Review, the magazine that they published, the quarterly. And he started in by saying, this man is the son of a Presbyterian preacher and he ought to know better. That was his introductory sentence. Well, I had occasion to revise the book on another matter altogether. And then I inserted in it a, quite a long uh, reply to Warfield, in which I think I rather made it embarrassing for him. He has said that God does everything. Now, God does under grace do everything, and that I want to make very clear. And it's our privilege to believe that and to reckon on it and count on it, and to have the advantage of his perfection instead of our failure. All of that is, is ours, yes. Warfield said that we, if it was God's will for us to be spiritual, we would be spiritual. And this thing of making you depend upon anything in us, he says, was very awful. It was very awful, terrible and awful mistake. I had, uh, I had exalted the element of the human will so high when I said that thing that depended on us. So I quoted some of these verses, such as that. If by means of the Spirit you are walking, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Whose responsibility is first in that? If by means of the Spirit you are walking, be filled with the Spirit. Whose responsibility is that? 
It's an appeal to you. Oh, I sent a copy of the revised book with the page marked to Warfield. I happen to know him personally. I received a postal card back from him, which he simply said, I have your book and noted what you said, and that's all he all there was to the argument. It is over. <laughs> with a postal card reply. Oh, he was a great man. I was speaking in Keswick, England, one night at 11 o'clock at night to a group of Scottish Presbyterian preachers. There was something like 80 of them there. And we were having a very good time. They were asking me questions about things in America, and I was free to ask them questions about things in Scotland. And I, I said to them, in your training for the ministry, whose theology do you use? And they spoke up and said, we never found anything better than Charles Hodge. Of course, Hodge was a Princeton theologian, and I thought that was a big concession, concession for Scottish Presbyterian preachers. Then I said to myself, to them, who do you consider is the greatest theologian in the world today? And they said, Benjamin Warfield went right back to Princeton again. Well, that's all right. And they were right in both instances. He was the greatest theologian, but he was strictly died in the world hyper-Calvinistic. And with that idea that God will do everything. Now, God does do everything in grace. There's nothing more important for us to understand than that we can do nothing. Every appeal, such as I've quoted in these scriptures, count on you to lay on hold of the power of God to get your victory in the way in which God has, has provided for you to get it. And that's for not for you to do it, but in the power of the Spirit for it to be done. Now you come face to face, men, with a new thing. And that is that there's, there is a, a plan for daily living on the part of the Christian. Just as much as ever there was a plan for your salvation. If I should talk about the plan of salvation, you would know right away what I mean, I think. That God has a way of saving souls and doing it himself in response to simple faith or believing. Now, if I say there's a plan for daily living, then I mean the same thing. And your, uh, your obligation is not to do it in any strength of your own or to try to do it, but to do it in the enabling power of the indwelling spirit. Are you getting that now? To do, do it in the enabling power of the indwelling spirit, the believer's responsibility brings him right there, and I'm going to have everything to say about that pretty much for the rest of this course, for that's the thing that constitutes the ability to live the spiritual life, is the ability to walk by means of the Spirit, and to know how to claim the vital power of the indwelling Spirit in your daily life. That's a salvation from the reigning power of sin as in the first answer you're saved from the penalty of sin. On this page, 162, our first division now, in this introductory word, our first division is the right motive. And I don't know how I can make this thing live as I want it to. What is your motive for doing right? I, I assume that above everything else in the world, you want to honor God with the right kind of a life. I believe that, man. You don't have to convince me on that. I believe it. But what's your motive? Why do you want to live life? Why do you want to live right? Is it in order that God may accept you? Or is it because he has accepted you? I've named in those two little phrases the major distinction between law and grace. Law was a merit system, and people did what they did to accumulate merit and to get the favor of God. That's the merit system, hoping that God will accept them. I don't need to tell you that 99 out of 100 of all the people that are members of our 
Protestant churches today are right on that ground. I've never heard of anything else. Never dreamed of anything else. They think their great new job is to win the favor of God. They don't know that they have the favor of God the moment they believe on Christ. Now, what can merit add to what you have already, if it's true, according to the scripture we saw last lesson, that by one offering he has perfected forever? What can merit add to that? Why should you want any merit? Before God, you don't need any merit. He has given you everything that he ever requires, and that's yours right now when you believe. That's yours right now when you believe. He's given you every merit that you need, and you don't have any obligation. Therefore, never, then, are you called upon to fall back on the merit system. Why are you not under the law? Because the law can't fit your circumstances at all. A merit system can't fit you when you've already attained to everything that God bestows. Well, then what? What shall I do? Walk worthy of the calling wherewith you're called. Not trying to be called. Not trying to be accepted, but because you are accepted. Because you are accepted. Now, honestly, look into your heart. Has that been the motive in your Christian life? That you have lived the best you could because you were set right? Or did you live the best you could hoping to be set right? There's a world of difference between those two things. I'm sure you don't need to be for me to multiply words here. But that's the difference right on the basis of it, of law and grace. And you're not under law because law cannot, a nerd system cannot apply or it cannot enter into your relation to God at the present time. You would be insulting him. You can see, I'm sure you'd be insulting him to immediately try to put yourself on a nerd basis. And as you put yourself there, you say, well, I'll add something to what God has done. And what he has done is to give me the perfection. I'm perfected forever in the one sacrifice of Christ. I am that. Now I am that. And I'm telling you, the moment that thing ever really breaks through into your consciousness, you're going to demand of yourself a manner of life that you're never demanded under the law in the world. Never. You'll say, if I'm like that, then I've got to be different. And that's the basis on which all appeal for a better manner of life must be made. Just to get up in a pulpit and scold people and tell them they ought to do this and they ought to do that. It's a loss of time in the first place. They're not going to pay attention to it. Second place, they're not going to do it even if they, if they did pay attention to it. You're not getting anywhere at all in scolding people. Not at all. Begin to show them what they are in Christ and, and all that that position is. And they'll apply it to their own lives. You needn't worry. They'll apply it to their own lives. They'll say, I've got to leave this thing out and that. If I'm what the, what the scripture says I am, I've got to leave this out and leave that out. They'll apply it to their own lives. That's why in preaching, life truth always, or positional truth, always proceeds in point of importance and proceeds life truth. In the great epistles, doctrinal officials, Romans, Ephesians, especially, you have this order. Take Ephesians for the six chapters. The first two, three chapters tell you what Christ has done for you. What Christ has done for you. And then the next three chapters tell you what you can do for him. As a Christian, someone who does things for God. If I stop a man on the street and tell him I want him to write down on this paper what he thinks a Christian is. He'll probably say he's a man who does things for God. He's one who keeps a certain day, who gives his money, and who attends a church and so on. He does certain things for God. That's the public idea. What is a Christian? A Christian is one for whom God has done things. Just as different as can be. A Christian is one for whom God has done things. 
And because these things are done and they're accomplished, therefore, you are not under the merit system at all. You are not under law. But you are under grace, and grace continues over you with its, with its manner of life. And the difference between law and grace is largely this, that under the law it is the best man could do. Under grace it's the best God can do. It's the best God can do under grace. And the startling thing, why you go back in your thinking and try to stand a minute at the time of the great transition, when Judaism was passing out for the time being, and the great system came in. There had to be a man who could stand in the gap. And that man that was selected, not out of the twelve apostles at all, though they had been with Christ for three and a half years. When God wanted a man to head up a new system, he went to the University of Gamaliel and got the most educated man of his day. The Apostle Paul became the Apostle Paul. He was Saul of Tarsus, educated man, and revealed it all to him. Then he became the, what Moses is in the Old Testament, Paul became in the New Testament. He was the former and shaper of the doctrine that constitutes the new relation to God. And he had a revelation from God. And it has to be a revelation to every person before they ever see it at all. Now, I can sit here and talk all these things until I go hoarse and can't speak another word. I'm not, I've made the slightest impression unless it's revealed to you. It's got to be revealed to you, man. The whole system of grace is a revelation from God. And men just don't get it until it's revealed to them. They just don't get it. And they fog around or using little texts and picking up little ideas here, never getting two great principles straightened out and two things separated. The difference between a merit system on the one hand and a grace system on the other. In the grace system, God does everything. He works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. But you come right down to the practical steps in the matter. And there you must always take the first step. It's your choice. You have the first move. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Walk in the light as he is in the light. And have fellowship one with another. Now I've tried to bring this matter of motive to the front. And what is your motive? Bring it down to a simple test. You're getting up in the morning, I say, what are you getting up for? Why to go about my duty and do my duty as it is? Oh, what are you doing it for? Well, I want to. I want to do the right thing. Yes, I know, but why do you want to do the right thing? Why do you want to do the right thing? Oh, well, I, I want God's favor on me. I want to win his favor. I want to work up something I can hand to him and he'll accept it. No, no. He's already handed you something, the only thing that he'll accept. And that's the imputed righteousness of God. That's the only thing that he'll accept. The theroma of the Godhead. You're made theroma in him. And you have it. Now don't say, I'll try to get it. Don't say, I'll try to get it. It isn't a thing that you've got to try to get. It's something you've got to recognize that you have. Because you're saved. Now, how important it is then for you to know that you are saved. To be able to say, yes, thank God, I am saved. And I can take the steps in that direction. An unsaved person cannot take the steps that are laid up to you as a Christian. He just can't take those steps because they don't belong to him to take. Never ask an unsaved person to, to believe that he has the righteousness of God because he doesn't. Or that he has to pull home of the Godhead bother resting on him because he doesn't. But you do have from the moment that you are saved. Now study these things carefully, men. This is what you've got to preach and teach if you're going to be true to the scriptures. 
these are the things that people are waiting for, and they'll just pay anything in the world almost to get it. There's a very rich, prominent church in the West that just written me a letter. Their pastor, one of our graduates, has been called away. They've written me say, asking me to name another graduate from this school. Why another graduate from this school? Because they want that doctrine that we're supposed to teach. They want that thing carried on, and they're ready to uh, make any effort or sacrifice to continue in the grace of God. On the page 167, you have the next division in this introduction as to responsibility, and that dependence upon the Spirit. Now, we have a whole chapter on that to study later, and I have shown many things I have to say on that. Later on, dependence on the Spirit. I was in a meeting in Charlotte, North Carolina, a good many years ago, and a young man who was an officer in the church called me up in the morning at the hotel said, could I talk with you for a minute? I said, come right away. Well, he said, I'll be in my car. I'll be at the door in a minute. I tripped down the stairs, and he was there at the door. I got in the car, and we drove out into a quiet place and parked the car for a conversation. And he began by saying, now, he said, I'm completely discouraged about my spiritual life, he said. I'm completely discouraged, and I thought you might help me. He said, I was, sure. I was so blue and discouraged over it, he said, that I didn't even go to breakfast this morning. I stayed in my room. Now, when he said he was discouraged, he was not saying that he was guilty of committing awful crimes, not that at all. But it was that he was not progressing naturally and normally as he ought to do, and he was discouraged over it. He said, I've written on, down on a paper a prayer that I made this morning. He said, I want you to look at that prayer and tell me what's wrong with it. So I took his little paper out of his hand and began reading. I wonder what you would have said to him if you'd been put in my place. He said, oh, Lord, I've failed, and I expect to be punished for it. I said, just a minute now. Let's stop right there. What are you talking about, I said. Well, he said, don't we have to be punished when we fail? I said, no, not if you confess it. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He says, you mean if I say I'm, to him that I'm wrong and it's all put away? I said, it is. Absolutely, forever. Well, he said, that's the most glorious thing I've heard in my lifetime. Now, he was thoroughly saved, an earnest boy, but he never had any teaching on how to live the Christian life. He didn't know anything about it. And I was just getting right at it with him. So he, I went on reading, and he said, and I promised to do better from this on. Now I said, son, I stopped again. I said, tell me, that was the end of his prayer. I said to him, how many times have you ever said that thing to God? He said, please don't speak of that. Don't rub that in, he said. That's the sore spot. Don't rub that in, he said, please. Well, I said, what's the use of your always promising God you're going to do better and then doing worse than you ever did before? What's the use of that? You've got to find some better way to live than you're living. Well, he said, what is that better way? Well, I said, let me tell you this. I think, I said, friend, his name was Trotter. I said, Trotter. I think what you need is to let God live your life for one day. Let God, the Holy Spirit who lives in you, live your life for one day. He said, what? I said, let God, the Holy Spirit, live your life for one day. Now, he said, perhaps you're talking sense, but if you are, I don't get it. That's all, he said. You mean, he said, I'm going to stay home in bed, and the Spirit's going to go down to the office? I said, no, I didn't say that at all. I said, you're going down to the office, and the Spirit is going with you. 
And you have put your trust in him in a way. You've counted on him in a way that he can do things in you that he never could do before. For you're depending upon him. Well, he said, uh, I think I begin to see something about it. He said, I'll try it tomorrow. I said, it's quite early in the day. Let's begin today. Let's begin now. So we had a little prayer meeting. And a very faulty, hesitating way, he, he put himself in the hands of the Spirit to live his life, to have power in his life for the day. And we left the place and went back to town. And I went into my hotel. He went away. I didn't see him the next day. I met him next day about noon, right in the busy part of the day on the street. He didn't see me for some time. And then when he did see me coming, facing him, he ran in the enthusiasm of a southerner. He threw his arms around me. He said, I'm scared most to death. I said, what are you talking about? What are you scared about? Well, he said, I'm so afraid I'll lose what I've got. Well, I said, what you got? Well, he said, life's so different since I made that prayer yesterday morning. So different. So different. Well, now, he did. His life was greatly changed. And what did he get? A second blessing? No, he didn't get a second blessing at all. Did he step out into something that he didn't have before? No. He simply made use of what he had all the time. He simply got and turned loose what he had all the time, and that was the power of the indwelling spirit. Turned loose that because he he counted on it and and magnified it. Then uh, here we have dependence upon the spirit as the next division of this thing. When I waken in the morning, the first thought may be, well, thank God I'm saved. Now listen, can you say that when you waken in the morning, thank God I'm saved? Can you say that? Or are you in doubt about it? Or are you just trying to do something that hasn't been settled yet? Yes, thank God I'm saved, but next thing is, that lays on me a responsibility of living on a plane that I'm totally unable to live on. I cannot do it. I cannot do it. I just can't do it. Now, back in the early days of my experience as an evangelist, America was just snowed down with drunkards, boozers, and we just had all the time in dealing with people who wanted to be saved. We always had to deal with a certain percentage of people who were who were given to alcohol habits. And we found out certain things that so long as a fellow thought that if he would really try, he could stop drinking. If he just tried, he could do it. There's no hope for that man. It was when he got to the place where he saw he couldn't do it and was willing to admit he couldn't do it, the things would happen. I have seen men lose their entire appetite for whiskey and had it never come back again. I've seen it over and over again. And they got to the place that they could trust God to lift them out of it and would admit that they couldn't do it. Now you've got to come to the point in your own reckoning that the things that are laid upon a Christian to do every day are just 10,000 times greater than anything you can do yourself. And therefore you fall back upon the infinite power. Think of it, the infinite power of the indwelling spirit. And when you begin to do that like Trotter did out there in Charlotte, when you begin to depend upon that power, then things begin to happen. And your life is entirely a different thing because you're living it in the power of the spirit. I'll turn over a page to 168, please. And I find here a section on the Word of God. And here I want to pause a minute again, though I've already 
at an earlier time spoken on this very thing. Men are divided into classes according to their attitude toward the Word of God. The Apostle Paul divides men into three classes three different times. And one of them is the division we have in 1 Corinthians, and I wish you'd turn to it again. 1 Corinthians, please, chapter 2. need now to have your Greek, because the English words just do not express what the Greek words express when you come to know them. In verse 14, but the psychicus man, the natural man, soulish man, the unsaved man. Receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, their foolishness unto him, neither can he know them. And when I touched this before, I told you a story about this man in his study, when the young fellow said that what he heard in the sermon was just foolishness, you remember that? And it's foolishness to him now, don't forget that man. It's foolishness to him. He doesn't get it, he doesn't get anything out of it. And that's why any man on the street that you may happen to meet is not able then and there necessarily to accept Christ. He can't do it. He can't receive it. It's a revelation. The gospel is a revelation. And after it's revealed to him, then he can act on it because it's revealed to him for that purpose. But until the gospel is revealed, they can't act on it. And the whole uh, bevy of evangelists over the whole country are just working on that basis that they get from the Arminian theology. Arminian theology has nearly ruined evangelism. And that Arminian theology says that every man has ability of his own will to, to accept Christ if he wants to any time, anywhere. Has he? No, he hasn't. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness unto him. And you've got to you've got to learn that all the eloquence that you can stir up in yourself and all the sweet singing you can employ is not going to reach the hearts of men until God the Holy Spirit reaches them. That's what's going to have to be done. And when God the Holy Spirit reaches them, then you won't have to have any arguments with him and you won't need any you won't need any methods at all. The little town I lived in Massachusetts for some years, we had a doctor in town who was a very wicked man. He was our family doctor, but we just couldn't get along without him at all. And I started in to pray for him. I think he had a profound respect for me, and I didn't argue with him. I took the ground that it's better to talk to God about people than it is to talk to people about God. It's better to talk to God about people first and then talk to people about God after your prayer has been answered and something's been done in their heart. Well, this man, I began praying for him, and I prayed two years. I saw him almost every day, but I never backed him up to the wall and made him say yes or no to some proposition of mine at all. I waited for evidence that God had moved on the heart of that man. And one night in my home, it was bitter cold in February, way below zero, my telephone rang while I was at my desk where I was studying. And it was this man's wife, who I didn't know very well, this doctor's wife. I didn't know her very well at the time. I came to know her very well afterwards. And she said, I want you to see the doctor just as soon as you can. He wants to talk to you. That's kind of a turning things around. Somebody to see the doctor. He's supposed to have a doctor see you, you know, in a hurry. Well, 
عشان حتى انا داكش معين او شي سيد هي he wants to be saved he says he wants to be saved but he, he doesn't know how and he thinks that you're the one man in town that could tell him and he's waiting to have you tell him now what's happened in his heart something's taken place but I tried to see the man it was the dead of winter and he was keeping several teams of horses worn out with his country driving and by the time I tried to see him I miss him he's gone somewhere and I I wouldn't get excited and say, oh, I've got to hurry and see him. He'll die before I see him. And then his blood will be on my hands. No, I didn't say that. I said, thank God I haven't found him yet. I'll find him when God wants me to. At the time that God wants me to, I'll be with him and talk with him. Well, I got in touch with him by telephone. And on a bitter cold night, he came to my house. He drove in at the back and hitched his team and blanketed him. It was actually 35 degrees below zero outside. And he blanketed his horses out there and came in through the, through the woodshed way in a New England house. He came in through the back way into the kitchen. And I was standing there at one o'clock in the morning with a little coal oil lamp in my hand. We didn't have electricity. I had a little coal oil lamp in my hand. He came in, had a great fur coat around him. And he came right up in front of me, began on hooking that coat all down, threw it off his shoulders and let it fall in a heap on the floor around his feet. Now he said, can you tell me how to be saved? I said, doctor, I can't. But he said, I think I'll die if somebody doesn't tell me how to be saved. What's happened? Did I need any methods? No, I didn't need any methods. All was needed then was just a statement of the gospel. So I took him into my little study set the lamp down on the desk and began telling him how Christ had died for him and stating the gospel to him. Pretty soon he interrupted me and said, why hasn't somebody ever told me that before? Well, I could have said, I could have argued with him and said, doctor, I reckon you've heard it a hundred times, but you're, you're hearing it now and it's eliminate, it's coming to you by revelation now, but I didn't say that to him. I was just happy that he was getting it. He said, I understand it. I can do that. I said, all right, will you accept Christ? He said, yes, I do. We knelt down together. And I thought then, in my own belief, I'd have to tell him to offer a word of prayer after I got through. He didn't wait for me to get through. He just broke in. And he sprung up to his feet when he finished a few sentences of prayer. He sprang to his feet and he said, I'm saved. And he says, you've got to go right down to my house, he says, and talk to my wife. So she isn't saved. Well, I didn't go down that night, but she was saved a few days after that. And perhaps just as wonderful a way. It's an illumination then. And a man, that's a natural man, cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God. They're a foolishness unto him. Up on the coast of Pacific Coast, at a little town in Oregon, little town from which Herbert Hoover came from, I was walking on the beach with an old man looking together on Christian things. And we were showing there to the waves rolling in that they almost went over our feet sometimes. And a young fellow in the freedom of the West, a young fellow heard something as we went by and he just fell in and walked with us and listened to what we said. And pretty soon the old man bid me goodbye and left me and went up the bluff to the cottage where he lived. He left me alone with this boy. And the boy began to ask me questions on what he'd heard. I said to him, just a minute, young fellow. I said, I, I've got to ask you one question before I can discuss anything with you. He said, what is it? I said, are you saved? He said, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. Well, I said, I can't talk with you about these things. He said, why not? I said, because you couldn't understand that. You can't understand them. You just can't understand them. Well, he said, I'd like to know why. He said, I graduated last year from the University of Oregon. And I'd like to know why I can't understand what other men understand. Well, I said, you can't, that's all. And I'm not going to talk to you until you're saved. And I said, if you'll accept Christ as your Savior. Five minutes after that, I'll talk this all over with you. But not until then. And he was so mad he just turned on his heel and left me. 
I met him a little later on the street up in the village, and he wouldn't even speak to me. I defended him so by sticking to this text. The natural man received it not the things of the Spirit of God. God spare you from going about arguing with unsaved people. Don't try to argue. And don't wonder if they don't understand what you say. The Scripture tells you why they don't understand. And don't wonder that if after you preached your most eloquent sermon, all the unsaved people are there, get up and walk out and don't do anything about it, don't you wonder. It's because the revelation hasn't reached them. What's needed is prayer more than more eloquent prayer. But they will be enlightened. That goes with it. I will dismiss for this time.